Good afternoon, everybody. My name is John Fitzgerald, District 3 City Councilor, and I'm the chair of the Boston City Council Committee on Public Health, Homelessness, and Recovery. Today is March 7th, 2024. This hearing is being recorded. It is also being live streamed at boston.gov backslash city dash council dash TV and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, Fios Channel 964. Written comments may be sent to the committee email at ccc.health at boston.gov and will be made part of the record and available to all counselors. Public testimony will be taken at the end of this hearing. Individuals will be called upon in the order in which they signed up and will have two minutes to testify. If you are interested in testifying in person, please add your name to the sign-up sheet near the entrance of the chamber. If you're looking to testify virtually, please email our central staff liaison, Megan Kavanaugh, at Megan, M-E-G-H-A-N, dot Kavanaugh, K-A-V-A-N-A-G-H, at boston.gov for the link and your name will be added to the list. Uh, today's hearing is on docket number 0264, order for a hearing to discuss the impact of for-profit urgent care centers on non-profit community health centers in the city of Boston. Uh, this, matter, uh, this matter was sponsored by Councillor Ed Flynn and Aaron Murray, Aaron Murphy, uh, and was referred to the committee on January 31st, 2024. Uh, today I'm joined by my colleagues in order of arrival, uh, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Worrell, Councillor Murphy, Councillor Louis Jen, and I believe that's all we have for at the moment. Um, there are some hard stops. We do have some... Uh, Folks, uh, some councilors that uh, said they would not be able to be here. Uh, I have letters of absentees from uh, Councilor Pepin, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, and um, uh, Councilor Weber. Um, I'll give one minute uh, each for our opening introductions, knowing we have some folks that are on the panel that have had stops, and us, obviously our lives are, are busy as well. Um, but so, uh, Councilor Flynn, we can start with you. Thank you, Councilor Fitzgerald, for chairing this important hearing. Councilor Murphy for being a co-sponsor on this docket with me. We filed this hearing order when we learned about a proposal for a for-profit urgent care center in close proximity to the South Boston Community Health Center. I was alarmed by the negative impact that this could have on the health center. The proposal was withdrawn, but the larger issue of for-profit urgent care centers and for-profit health care still remains. We need to remain vigilant about any future proposals and the impact it has on nonprofit community health centers. I know we are also aware that recent news on Stewart Healthcare and the serious concerns we share about potentially devastating impacts that could lead to a health care access and health care quality issues for all of us, but especially our seniors, persons with disabilities, communities of color, immigrant neighbors, our most vulnerable residents living in public housing. Today, I'm asking us to keep our focus on for-profit health care in our neighborhoods and the impact they have on Boston. Recent years, there have been an increase in the number of urgent care centers in our city, where these clinics offer free walk-in service for patients experiencing non-emergency medical issues, while urgent care centers might offer convenient, quick care to patients. Some of these clinics are for-profit and seen as an investment opportunity for private equity firms, venture, cap venture capital firms. One reason they are seen as attractive investments, opportunities, as urgent care centers do not have the legal obligation to treat patients if they do not have the ability to pay, unlike emergency departments. Many urgent care centers do not accept Medicaid, which creates a barrier to access for low-income patients. We are now seeing for-profit urgent care centers being proposed in close proximity to nonprofit community health care centers who provide similar services, which can threaten the financial viability of these invaluable community health centers. As mentioned, a for-profit urgent care center was proposed on West Broadway in South Boston, one block away from the South Boston Community Health Center. This proposal had the potential to negatively impact the community health center and to take away its patient base. This is not a health care desert, so to speak. So there are no community need here with this proposal less than a block away, especially when the nonprofit South Boston Community 
Health Care Center is already in the process of expanding ex existing urgent care at this facility, which will take non-patients on April 1st. The Community Health Center has also been an urgent care clinic in South Boston Waterfront and is currently available to non-patients as well. I was deeply concerned about what could happen to my constituents across South Boston, including our seniors, persons with disabilities, communities of color, immigrant neighbors, residents of public housing at Mary Ellen McCormick, Old Colony, West 9th Street, West Broadway Development. I was down there today in West Broadway Development. In the final analysis, South Boston Community Health Center has been an invaluable partner with the people of South Boston for 50 years, serves 70,000 patients annually, with the largest for-profit care company in the country, offers a fraction of the services, and can pack up and leave at any time if they're unhappy with their profit margin. And we're all left to pick up the pieces. I'll, I'll wrap up in a second. Sorry to take an extra minute. Boston has many great community health centers serving our neighborhoods and our constituents by providing valuable quality health care to residents, including the South Boston Community Health Center, South Cove Community Health Center, Codman Square Health Center, Bowdoin Street, East Boston Health Center, Fenway, and many more. Let me be clear, I do not want to see cuts to program services and staff at any of these beloved community health centers. They're our partners, they're our neighbors. So we called for this hearing today to, to ask my colleagues and the people of Boston to be aware of this issue. As similar to other developments that has taken place, this may be just the first shoe to drop in another neighborhood. There will likely be more for-profit urgent care centers being proposed in our city, and some may be right next to these invaluable community health centers. In closing, I also want to note that the good, good news of my, for my constituents was short-lived, as we learned that the BPDA previously made a recommendation to the ZBA to approve the for-profit urgent care proposal, as it had, even though it was withdrawn. On the council floor, I noted that after all we've heard for years about profit motive in health care, the Boston Planning Department was still ready to recommend a for-profit next to a non-profit. In my view, it would have been short-sighted and put the public health of the town at risk. I could never stand for that. So that kind of planning needs to be discussed and part of the solution. We need to hear from the BPDA and ask them not to recommend for-profit medical care facilities next to health centers. Again, we need to understand how this can impact our community health center quality of care and how we can better improve access with local health centers and hospitals. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Flynn. Uh, Council Rell is not with us at the moment. Uh, Councilor Murphy. Thank you, Chair. Is this your first hearing in person? I think, huh? It is. Yeah. It is, because yeah. I'm like, I haven't heard your voice there. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for being here. I probably said it many times on my time here on the council, but I'm a patient of the South Boston Health Center, so thank you for the amazing service you give me, my children go. Um, so, and also thank you, Councilor Flynn, for your um, fierce advocacy for everything in your district, but as soon as I heard, um, you know, that the South Boston electeds were rallying around this and Margaret Lynch and others, obviously yourself, reaching out from the health center concerned, um, I, I thought that the for-profit was not going to have a chance. It was disheartening that the planning board was uh, on board to support it. So I just do want to highlight before I say a few words of the wonderful work you do at the health center that it's an example. It doesn't happen all the time, but it is an example of when people know something wrong is about to happen if you really rally together and share the good reasons that the good good will happen. So right now we're in a good place, but like Councilor Flynn mentioned, we have to just keep keep our uh, keep alert on that. But the South Boston Community Health Center has been providing essential quality of life health care, right? And I know, for, you know, since through the pandemic, also, right? You expanded your food access, 
and you gave vaccines and your staff you know, risked their life and showed up every day like they did at every health center across the city. But especially, um, you know, the, just the numbers, I don't have to read them. I know Councilor Flynn touched on some of them, you know, but the population you serve is our most vulnerable. And I think what most, if not all of the councilors here feel like we have to always uplift and support those residents who go to you and you know, not, not just for their shots or for their health care, they need so much more mental health. You offer, you know, eye care, dental, have, um, and the food access alone is just commendable. So anytime we know that you're, you're all, always battling to raise money and pay your bills and provide, you know, and, and you're trying to expand because you know that the services are needed, anytime that that, you know, gets in your way and you have to fight harder, I just hope you know that we'll always, I know I myself, I'll always speak for myself, but I believe my colleagues also will always be there to support you in any other health center. I will just end on, I know Councillor Baker is not with us anymore, but anytime we talked about community health centers, he uplifted his mother who started the little house with her neighbors and it's just a good story about, you know, when neighbors know that there's a need and healthcare is such a need, you know, they rallied together and made sure that the services that their neighbors needed were there. So know that you do that every day and I just applaud you for that. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Councilor Murphy. Councilor Louis Jen. Uh, thank you, Councilor Fitzgerald, and I just want to thank everyone for being here. I think this is just revelatory of the problems of having profit, the profit model in healthcare. And we see it over and over again. Just got off a call right now about the Benjamin in the back of the hill. Um, we are dealing with the fallout of steward healthcare, and we see this time and time again that the bosses care about profit, and those who make up our hospitals, those who make up our community health centers care about people, and healthcare should really be about people. So uh, I'm not going to belabor the points that have already been made, but I do think it's important for us to, you know, there's probably limited regulatory authority for us to limit uh, the placement of certain institutions, but I do think it's, a, it's about how are we um, being intentional about investing in our community health centers, how are we being intentional about uh, investing in alternative models um, so that when things like this happen, we can, we, we are claiming space without fear in our neighborhood. So I just want to thank Bill for being here. I looked at your letter and, and saw just like the work, even among all of this, you were extending uh, the health center opening and being welcomed for our new arrivals to care for them. That's important work that oftentimes when you look at our public spaces, when you look at community-based spaces, we are always saying yes because again, our concern is not about profit, it's about people. I wanna thank you, Michael, for being here. You were sort of at the root of all of this when it comes to health equity, when it comes to making sure our community health centers around the Commonwealth and in the city of Boston have the support that they need from government elected officials, but also from our federal government to make sure that our, um, our community health centers uh, are really thriving. If, if it were up to me, every, health, uh, every uh, community health center would be as big and as great as the one in East Boston and the work that they're doing. I advocate day and day uh, for a, a, a bigger Madison Health Center. So just want to shout out to you. I see my friend Bob Edwards here from the Whittier uh, Street, uh, Health Center. I want to thank everyone who's part of the, our community health centers for the great work that they do. And of course, Dr. Ojukutu. So thank you and thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilor Louis Jen. Uh, I would now like to introduce today's panelists. Uh, and I just say myself, as having family members that use community health centers as well, I appreciate you all being here and the services you provide. So thank you very much. Um, thank you for taking the time, but let's uh, introduce uh, today's panelists testifying on behalf of the administration. Uh, I'll allow you guys to introduce yourselves first. Uh, I'll call out the one person that we, we don't currently have here that was invited, uh, and then we can um, move on with the presentation. Okay. So, we'll start with you, Ms. Holt. Okay. Good afternoon, Chairman Fitzgerald, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Murphy, and Council President Louis Jean. I'd like to start by particularly thanking Councillor Flynn um, for filing this hearing order and for elevating this important issue. I'm Dr. Basola Ojikutu. I'm the Executive Director of the Boston Public Health Commission and the Commissioner of Health for the City of Boston. So I'm here on behalf of the Boston Public Health Commission to say that we absolutely share your concerns about the potential negative impact of for-profit urgent care clinics on our community health centers in Boston. I know that you'll be hearing from my, fe my fellow panelists, uh, Michael Curry, President of the Mass League, and Bill Halpin, CEO of Boston, South Boston Community Health Center, both of whom I've spoken to about this issue recently. And they will speak about the unique role the community health centers play throughout our city, but I do want to say a few words about why they are so important, particularly from a public health perspective. 
So we're very lucky in Boston. We currently have a nation-leading network of community health centers that provide access to high-quality, timely, and affordable health care for residents, regardless of their ability to pay. The health care services that are provided by our community health centers are uniquely designed to be linguistically appropriate and culturally tailored to the communities that they serve. And that is not the case around the country. So again, we are, we are very lucky. Our health centers provide access to primary care services, on-site specialty care, and referrals to our vast network of academic and community hospitals. They also offer same-day services for time-sensitive needs, and several in Boston have urgent care centers. And as a physician who's worked at community health centers in Massachusetts, I know firsthand that they are an essential component to our healthcare ecosystem in Boston. From a public health perspective, community health centers are a key ally in our mission to advance population level health equity across Boston. As you all are aware, there are stark health inequities in our city. These inequities are largely driven by social determinants of health, which are the conditions in our environment, in our neighborhoods, it's how people live, how they work, where they work, where they play, our built environment, and includes access to care, socioeconomic status, education, social networks, and many other factors. As public health partners, community health centers lead work that extends far beyond their physical walls and deep into their, their local communities. Health centers provide employment to community members, which improves the economic vitality of our neighborhoods. They provide access to food, as has been spoken of, and improve nutrition security. They provide social services that connect patients to resources. And interestingly, in many cases, they are a social hub within their neighborhoods where residents meet to increase their health literacy and gain access to health-related information. These are critical public health roles, and we will not be able to advance health equity if we don't invest in our community health centers. This spring, the Boston Public Health Commission will issue a new Health of Boston report. That report will describe the healthcare landscape in Boston. And what we know is that in addition to our 11 hospitals, we also have over 20 community health centers and three for-profit urgent care centers. Two are located in the Back Bay, and one is in West Roxbury. We are very fortunate to have an abundance of healthcare resources, but from a public health perspective, we need to be particularly focused on how urgent care centers fit within this healthcare ecosystem and whether these institutions really provide meaningful access to quality, high quality, timely, affordable healthcare, particularly for low income residents. For clarity, I think it's helpful to describe urgent care clinics. In Massachusetts, urgent care centers are licensed as clinics and hospitals or hospital satellites and may operate under a physician license. They can be for-profit or they can be non-profit. They usually have physicians on staff and provide diagnosis and treatment for a broad range of non-emergency conditions, sore throats, rashes, sometimes more pressing conditions like broken bones that require x-rays, and sometimes people with chronic conditions who cannot see their primary care provider, we know there are gaps in our system, end up going to urgent care um, clinics. They tend to accept patients you know, on a walk-in basis and have hours of service beyond normal weekday hours. These things are important because they can divert people away from our overcrowded emergency departments. Urgent care is licensed and regulated at the state level. Statewide, there has been a significant increase of urgent care clinics, growing from just 15 in 2010 to 173 in 2021. There is a growing conversation at the state level led by both the Massachusetts Health Policy Commission and the Department of Public Health about the best ways to regulate these entities, including the need for more comprehensive oversight and requiring data regarding the utilization, quality, and cost of services provided at these centers. While urgent care clinics can be an important resource, it's important to acknowledge the potential impact of for-profit urgent care in Boston, especially how it impacts nonprofit community health centers. If these services are geographically close to community health centers providing similar services, they will divert patients away from community health centers because they have insurance that has a higher reimbursement rate and oftentimes patients who are younger will also be diverted to urgent care clinics away from the community health center. These are the patients who keep our community health centers viable. There are also concerns about coordination of care for patients when they're using standalone for-profit urgent care that is disconnected from the health care center, disconnected and sort of outside of the health care ecosystem that has been created. 
Lastly, I just want to talk a little bit about the Boston Public Health, Care Com Health Commission and our long history of partnership with our community health centers. It is really important that we continue to support community health centers. Within the Commission's founding legislation, our Board of Health includes two members from CHC's community health centers. Currently, these seats are filled by Guale Valdez, the President and CEO of Mattapan Community Health Center, and Greg Wilmot, the President and CEO of East Boston Neighborhood Health Center. We deeply appreciate their leadership and their partnership. We also partner with and fund community health centers in different ways, and we have done so for many years. We support health center operating budgets with annual direct funding. We also offer a variety of different grant programs to health centers to drive innovation and encourage adoption of best practices and new models of care. In addition, a number of our programs from maternal health to substance use disorder to violence prevention are directly linked with our community health centers. In South Boston specifically, we need to support the local community health center to address the area's significant health care needs. According to our recent Health of Boston reports, life expectancy in South Boston is 78 years, that's five years lower than in Back Bay, which has the highest life expectancy in the city. The neighborhood also has the sixth highest age-adjusted mortality rate in the city and almost 30% of adults have hypertension. The way to improve these health outcomes is to work in partnership with our local community health center, not to establish a new parallel for-profit institution. We look forward to continued collaboration with our community health center partners across the city, continued collaboration with the city council, and thank you for this opportunity to participate today. I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you, Dr. Ojukutu. <clears throat> um, sorry, if we go, uh, Mr. Curry, next. Please and thank you, and then we'll let you know. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Fitzgerald, Vice Chair Murphy, um, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Worrell, and uh, Madam uh, Chair, Pres uh, Madam President um, of the Council. It is an honor and a privilege to be with you today. Uh, as was said, my name is Michael Curry. I am uh, CEO of the Massachusetts League of Community Health Centers, and I'm here on behalf of 52 member organizations that we represent across the Commonwealth. Of those, 22 are located just here in the city of Boston. Uh, we are the home, the birthplace of community health centers in 1965 here in Boston. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify before the City Council Committee on Public Health, Homelessness, and Recovery uh, on the impact of for profit urgent care centers or nonprofit community health centers in the city of Boston. These entities pose an existential threat to the health center model of care and accessible community-based care overall. And we are grateful that you are highlighting such a critical issue. We are seeing a proliferation of for-profit urgent care centers, not only in Boston, but around the city, around the country. Uh, we're seeing this as well. It raises questions about the types of organizations we want to rely on to care for our communities especially those who face enormous barriers to accessing care. We have a two-tiered health care system, no surprise to any of you. Community health centers are paid far less than any other types of providers to provide high-quality, integrated care to those who need it most, allowing more for-profit organizations to open up shop in our neighborhoods would destabilize an already fragile system and exacerbate and divide between the two tiers in our system when we should be working as a city to close that divide. Unlike the health center model of care, which by mission or by law in our case, FQHCs, Federal Qualified Health Centers, requires that care be open and accessible, including affordable to all, and through a sliding fee scales established by community boards, for-profit companies all, uh, alternatively are driven by profit motive and is often at odds with providing services. Uh, when a for-profit urgent care center opens, a few things happen. They cherry-pick the least medically complex patients. It's about revenue. It's about turning over uh, transactions and, and engagement with patients that generate uh, a volume of revenue. Use the financial benefits of this cherry-picking to offer better employment terms to critical staff that could destabilize our workforce and organizations. This trend would leave health centers with a smaller, burnt out workforce providing services to a population of the mostly medically complex patients among us. Our health centers are already struggling with overwhelming demand for care, competing in a high cost labor market and responding to arrival of immigrants uh, and increased patient population experiencing homelessness. And when it's no longer profitable 
These companies can close their doors with no notice or obligation to the community. When your only motive is profit, that can, that can and does happen in the blink of an eye. We see this playing out in Roxbury with the closure of Walgreens and the potential closure or acquisition of Stewart Hospitals. Health centers will be asked to respond, just as we always have, and they'll be asked to respond if, in, a, in many different ways if any of these for-profit entities, including for-profit urgent care centers, close uh, and we all will take on their patients. Imagine this very plausible scenario. These for-profit centers enter Boston at scale as they desired to years ago when Mayor Menino worked to prevent that. Health centers became financially stable, destabilized and closed or, or had reduced capacity due to a lack of workforce and catastrophic impacts to their case mix. I'm giving you the scenario of what could happen. Of course, it's the worst case scenario, but it is foreseeable. Uh, I served in this role when we lost Roxbury Comprehensive Health Center, the health center that I got my care at, uh, as well as Whittier Street many years before that. What would Boston have looked like during COVID without the absolutely heroic response of our Boston health centers on testing, vaccination, and treatment? Our health centers, our, our, our health centers who stayed open for medical, dental, and behavioral health services are the true heroes and sheroes in the city to provide responding to the COVID pandemic. What would happen if our Roxbury Health Centers had been forced out of business or for-profits have taken over their operations? What if instead our pharmacies closing, we saw the only health centers in these communities closing because of corporate office, the corporate office decided the margin was no longer adequate. And this in contrast to the health centers where patient majority boards make the decisions, not um, investors. We don't, we don't have to think very long to imagine the, the exacerbation of health inequities and increase in mortality gap that would, that would cause. The uh, president of the council mentioned earlier my passion, our passion around health equity. The reality is we have to solve for these challenges that are causing neighborhoods like South Boston or Roxbury or Chelsea um, or many other parts of our communities across the, the city and the state to live shorter lives and die too soon. Uh, one of the reasons that we need to make sure that we're very conscious about this is the care needs to be integrated. It needs to be coordinated. Uh, it can't be episodic. It can't be fragmented. Uh, and this conversation today is one of the things we're most worried about is fragmented care. The need to protect and invest in the community health centers and safety net providers and truly recognize them as essential community resources is what this is all about. If we are serious about addressing the life expectancy gaps between neighborhoods in the city of Boston, about advancing health equity, ensuring that all black, brown, low income Boston residents are able to live long and healthy lives, then we, we need to maintain our national leadership as the birthplace of the health center movement and the community-based community healthcare model. We cannot allow for for-profit organizations to destabilize our community health providers. We deeply appreciate the council bringing this attention uh, to uh, the city of Boston and this hearing today. Thank you, Mr. Curry. Mr. Alpin. Uh, Chairman Fitzgerald, Vice Chair Murphy, and uh, distinguished members of the committee, um, Madam President uh, demonstrated that she read my, my uh, written testimony, so I'm going to uh, do a little pivot here, if you will, and just uh, kind of speak from the heart rather than uh, rather than read the comments. Um, Councillor Councilor Ed Flynn um, was very eloquent in, in his comments about what community health centers do. And, and I'd just like to tell a couple of stories that could demonstrate the impact of for-profit health care. Um, these urgent care centers, they, you know, they skim the profitable patients and the easy patients, and they make money by churning. As my, my friend Michael Curry um, suggested, community health centers are in the business of comprehensive health care. Um, so it's more than just identifying, you know, that somebody has strep throat or an infected ear or something. It's, it's much more than that. There's, there's food equity issues, there's mental health issues, there's the, you all know all, all these issues. But where the skimming really becomes problematic is um, 
primary care and, and delivering primary care in a comprehensive and integrated manner is like really hard work. And um, there isn't a week that goes by. There is not a week that goes by where my chief medical officer does not appear in my office and say to me, Bill, I just spent an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and a half with a recent immigrant, a, a patient whose life has just become so fractured for, for all different reasons. And that, think about that. Think about spending an hour and a half with a patient trying to sort through all their issues. And then doing that back to back to back, you, you know, it's just a prescription for burnout. And it's why a lot of people don't want to go into primary care anymore. Um, and so those easy visits, the 15 minute sore throat, the earache, the, the, you know, mm -hmm. they, they live for those. Mm -hmm. and, and they make the day much more, more manageable. Um, the, uh, and, and the difference between for-profit and community health centers is really pretty basic. As, as I mentioned in my comments, I, I was visited by um, some people from the, the State Department of Public Health two days ago, and they came in and they were you know, very pleasant, and they kind of got around to what they wanted to talk to me about, which was, you know, could we help out with the, um, with the migrant uh, crisis and the shelter that's being opened in the Fort Point um, area, I think today, tonight, tomorrow, whatever. Um, I, look, we're a community health center. Our first, like, you know, sure, of course we'll help. How do we help? What do we do? Not, am I going to be able to make money on those, those patients? I already know I'm not, so, <laughs> you know, why well, ask the question, but no, I, you know, it's just, that's what community health centers are. We're about helping people, we're about helping them get their lives back on track. And, you know, it, it, virtually everyone's mentioned the, the response during the, during the pandemic. We were up and running a, a testing in vaccine clinics long before the federal and state and local officials stepped up with, with great resources, and, and we were delighted they did. But we were doing it, you know, before the money came. And to the extent that an urgent care center opens, takes away paying customers, easy, it just makes our lives so much more complicated and frankly threatens our existence because at some point, you know, as, as Council Murphy pointed out, we're always kind of, you know, seeking additional resources. At some point, we can't keep doing that, you know, we, we just can't keep doing that. There'll, there'll be, if we're sufficiently under-resourced as we are, you know, we're not going to be able to stay in business, but we're not in the business to make money. We don't, I mean, I don't want to say we don't care about making money, but that's not what we do. We're here to take care of families, take care of our community. You know, when South Boston years ago had the, um, the awful um, opioid um, suicide epidemic, this was probably 20, 25 years ago now. We were the first first place to step up and say, "Okay, what do we do? How can we how can we make an impact on this?" And I found that our youth ambassadors program. That, that um, so I I could go on all afternoon because I'm obviously speaking from the heart. And Ed Flynn is probably sick of hearing these stories <laughs> from me. So so I'll stop. But thank you for the uh, thank you for the opportunity to. Uh, to testify, and thank you for all of your support. It, it's, um, it, it does not go unnoticed. Um, um, so, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Halpin, I appreciate it. Um, we were supposed to have one other panelist, uh, Deputy Chief Devin Quirk, he's not able to make it, so uh, we will move on to, um, I'd like to thank all of you for, for the testimony, uh, and I'd like to acknowledge the sponsors to begin with, with the first round of questions. Uh, then I'll turn it over to the floor.
Yes, and he will be uh, second on the round of questions. But he was, thank you very much, Councillor. Um, I would like to remind my colleagues, though, that there are several folks on the panelists as well as Council have a hard stop. And so uh, to get the most out of this panel, uh, let's try and keep the, 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 the questions brief and let the answers be longer, and we will move on. Um, Mr. Uh, Council Flynn, we'll start with your, your question. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the panel, Dr. Ojukutu, for your professional work that you've been, do been doing for so many years. Bill Halpin is a tr tremendous leader at the South Boston Community Health Center, um, an outstanding organization, and Michael Curry, thank you for what you've been doing as well, dealing with challenges in the medical and public health community. And I also wanted to acknowledge, Michael, your tremendous advocacy for people across the city, including uh, Asian, Asian health as well. It's, I, I, I respect what you're doing, helping everybody. Um, Bill, on, we work together, you, 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 the South Boston Community Health Center was the first health center that opened up a um, pandemic, during the pandemic vaccination site. And I live on F Street, as you know, right where, where the corner of the health center is. Um, you helped a lot of people with vaccinations, but you also provided food access, which was a critical part of uh, providing services to, to residents as well. Um, why would you say, why would you say that um, having a for-profit organization would have a devastating impact to your health center and financially, but what impact would it have on providing medical care to patients as well? Um, well, the financial impact has been well documented and, and addressed here. Um, and I, I circle back to my comments about my chief medical officer coming in my office periodically and saying how long it takes to see the patients. You know, if, if she has to spend an hour and 15 minutes with, um, with any patient, and we, she does, and she does it very willingly, um, that spills over into the rest of her schedule, and we either have to reschedule those patients or have them seen by another provider. You know, the, the patient that was booked back to back with the, with the um, patient that's taking so long. And, and so ultimately, um, counselor, it, it could actually have a very negative impact on access to care. Uh, because the more of those that we see, and I'm expecting that the, that the uh, migrants that will come to us from Fort Point will fall into this category, that pushes access out for, for, the, rest of our, for the rest of our patients. So, I, and again, I'm not, we're not complaining, we're, we're gonna do it willingly, but we're trying to serve everybody in South Boston and it just becomes exceedingly difficult. Uh, and, and then you throw on top of that the fact that, um, you know, we are under-resourced in reimbursement rates while improving in the recent past, still don't cover the cost of, of what, it, the, what it costs us to take care of these patients. You know, people wouldn't think, but I have a pretty extensive um, interpretive service, it, mm -hmm. you know, I have interpreters, financial counselors, a food pantry, the list goes on and on. Well, somebody's got to pay for all of that. And right now it's kind of us, <laughs> so. Um, uh, Mr. Curry? I just want to respond to it, it's, uh, and I think Bill did a great job of explaining how complicated providing care is. And I think the way I would describe it, and this is me putting on my professor hat, um, is that when you walk in to get care, there are so many aspects of what it costs to provide you that care that you would never see. You don't know what it costs you, right? You don't know the recruitment that went into recruiting that provider or the benefits that that provider has paid or the incentives that that provider receives in order to serve you the, the care. You don't know the building cost the, uh, that it takes to maintain that building, to have that building in place for you to be 
have access. You, you, there's so many aspects of that care. So when Bill said earlier that we're providing care and we're doing it the margins, we're not making huge profits, um, that ecosystem when you walk in is really delicate. So we rely on not only hopefully getting adequate reimbursement to provide the care we're giving you, but also if you use the pharmacy services. Mm -hmm. Also, there's some cross-subsidizing going on that helps us to pay for interpreter services Bill talked about. The reason I lift that up is when I say it's very delicate, it means that something like a for-profit entity next door could destabilize that system and then drive you from maybe you know, holding your own and being able to pay those bills and, and so forth to now running deficits because those patients are getting care, uh, some care elsewhere. Last point I'll make on that is who, what patients they want, to, to Bill's point. They want the patients and they want the services that drive large amounts of revenue. That means they're happening frequently in their um, low threshold care. Um, they also want commercial, right? And we say Medicare, Medicare, commercial. Um, that's a subsidy, a subsidizing that happens in health centers. We don't have large amounts of commercial patients. But when our health centers do, they rely on that balance between Medicare, subsidized, commercial, uh, and so forth in order to make those payments, those, those, in order to keep the finance of the health center strong. So I, I, I think the major point I'm making is, is that the infrastructure, the financial infrastructure of a health center is so delicate, every single one of them across the Commonwealth. And um, this poses a threat to that. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Bill. Uh, I don't have any further questions at, during this round, but let me just end with, with this. Um, Bill, you mentioned that the South Boston Community Health Center is going to be helping and supporting our migrant families. Thank you uh, for your compassion, for your team's compassion, supporting our migrant families in South Boston. A friend of mine is also the works at the South Boston Neighborhood House and they're also going to be providing some social services as well. Um, it's about working together. It's about treating people with respect. It's about treating people with dignity. What I like about the health center, well, let me, let me just stop for one quick second. One person said to me, hey, Flynn, who, who do you think you are to deciding who comes into the neighborhood or not? Um, so I responded that I represent the largest number of residents living in, in public housing of any, of any district councilor in the city. And many of them, most of them are, are, are people of color. Many of them also are, go to the South Boston Community Health Center. Um, if they didn't have the South Boston Community Health Center, they would be at a terrible disadvantage mm -hmm. trying to get medical care so I said to this person, you know, you have the best health, health care plan probably. You're probably making $300,000 and good for you. But that's not my job. My job is representing people that need that critical health care. People of color, immigrants, seniors, persons with disabilities, working class families. That's what I think of when I think of the, not just the South Boston Community Health Center, all the health centers across the city. And I won't, I won't name them, but I think they do a terrific job of providing compassionate, quality health care to people in need. And if we forget that mission, we're going to lose a little bit of our soul in the city. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Flynn. I'd like to note that we've been uh, joined by Council Durkin as well. Council, thank you so much. Uh, Council Worrell, uh, your line of questioning, if you have any. Oh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to the panel that's here today. Uh, I want to thank you for all your work. Um, I know uh, those health, um, health uh, community health centers play a vital role in our community. Um, just hearing from you know Michael Curry on health centers operate within the in the margins, uh, but then also understanding the health outcomes that our communities face. Like how how do what, like. How do we help expand the services, right, to our communities that are facing those barriers and those health outcomes? And what support would you need, you know, from um, BPHC or the city of Boston to be kind of supportive on providing resources so we could bolster, you know, services um, to change those health, health outcomes? 
And, and uh, Dr. Oji Kutu and Bill, I'm sure, think about this, talk about this all the time, so I'll just sort of tee it off, that I think, one is we realize we have a problem, not only in Boston, but across the country, in Massachusetts. The, the problem of access, mm -hmm. that no matter who you are in this room, if you got sick today, you'd be waiting in an emergency room for three, four, five hours at best. Right. Um, and then you might not get the care you need because they're strained on resources as well, right? They're bleeding providers, they're strained and stressed as well. Um, primary care is underinvested in, in the Commonwealth, in, in Boston. So uh, organizations like Bill's are not getting the resources they need to provide you that medical home that you need so that whether it's your te teeth, your eyes, your mental health, your substance use disorder, or that pain in your side, that they have what they need in order to meet your needs. The, we tell people all the time, the average wait time for a health center patient that's new is 80 days right now. Hmm. For, a, for an existing patient, on average, is 40 days. So the system is not prepared to respond to the needs post-COVID um, that people have across the Commonwealth, then quality becomes an issue. Are we making sure that people are getting quality care no matter what setting they walk into? And that's not, that's the challenge as well. And affordability, can people afford to pay the copay, the co-insurance? So we think about to your question, Councilor, around, around Boston and specifically what can be done is we know what works. We know primary care, and I say this all the time, pay now or pay greater later. Mm -hmm. You invest in Bill, you keep them out of the emergency room. If you get them the care they need through primary care, you keep that cancer from becoming stage four, and you get to it when it's stage one. We've not really understood that we don't pay now, and then we end up paying greater later. So whatever you can do, whatever the council can do, whatever the city can do, to really beat that drum at every level to say, no, we want to pay now. We want to invest in institutions and organizations like Bill's so that we can save lives in South Boston, so that we can keep people healthy and they're staying out of the most expensive settings in our system. Thank you. Uh, if I could, thank you. Um, and thank you for, for raising the, the issue. Um, one of the things, one of the specific things I think the city council could do um, is sort of work with the Mass League and, and really get to know community health centers. Um, I tell people all the time, and, and it, it's just so true, if you go visit a community health center, pick any health center. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've seen it happen over and over and over again. Somebody comes for a tour of South Boston Health Center, and they walk, you know, we walk, it's a three-story building, we start at the top, we go down to the basement, and I just watch, light bulbs going off in their head. They go, oh, you have a food pantry? Oh, you have counselors available for adolescents who are struggling with gender identity or whatever, pick a topic. Mm -hmm. and, and it's really, it's really remarkable. And I, I think if, if, if the council did that, that's a real great first step in local advocacy which then can expand to state advocacy, to federal, you know, you, you know, you know that better than I, but um, that, that'll be a great first step. Mm -hmm. Dr. Oach Kutu is coming to my health center in two weeks. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward very much so to, to the visit. I just want to add to what's already been stated because I appreciate everything that, that Michael has stated and that, that Bill has also stated. But just t taking a step back, for a second just talking about the health ecosystem, right? We know we have these disparities, we know that we have these issues with life expectancy gaps across our city, 23 years or more between one area and another area. These inequities don't begin in the healthcare system. And I right. think if you just look at Boston, this is a prime example of the fact that they don't begin in the healthcare system. We have 11 premier hospitals, academic and community health centers. We have 22 wonderful community health centers. We have these urgent care centers, some of them nonprofit, some of them for profit, but they're providing care. We have problems, as Michael has mentioned. Okay, we don't have great primary care, we haven't invested there. But what we need to be doing is realizing that we have to invest upstream. You know, the th kinds of things that we talk about 
about when we talk, start talking about budget hearing time. You right. know, we, we need to be investing in our housing, we need to be investing in our education, we need to be investing in our built environment, our parks, all of these things are critical to what we need to do here in Boston. At the same time, we need to realize that our community health centers are a critical piece of the health ecosystem because what they're doing that's, I think, specifically unique to Boston, just because I know what's happening across the country, they are really focusing in on some of these social determinants of health on the individual and family level. They're doing things like nutrition and security. Right. The, but bringing those two pieces together, thinking about if they're working on individual level nutrition security, that we need to make sure we have good groceries right. <laughs> in the neighborhood, you right. know, because we can't just give one person or one family. We have to think together, how do we do that? And we need to work more specifically on navigating people back into care. Michael mentioned deferred care and what's happening during COVID. We still have people who are not seeing their primary care doctor on a regular basis. We need CHWs, we need community health workers, we need patient navigation. We need better connectivity and de-siloing of our healthcare system here in Boston. We need to be working closer together. Thank you for that. And I just want to give a big shout out to um, um, my good friend in the crowd. Uh, during COVID, um, we um, stood up, I don't know how many COVID sites on Bowdoin Street and um, gave out plenty of vaccines. So we're here. Huh? Mm -hmm. About 10, 10, <laughs> 10, 10, mo yeah, 10 mobile vaccination sites right on, on Bowdoin Street mm -hmm. um, during the middle of COVID. So thank you, Bob. Appreciate all your support and Whittier's contribution to this um, city. Uh, no further questions. Thank you, Council Rell. Council Murphy. Um, thank you I, for all of that. I just want to highlight that. Council of Flynn and I filed this hearing order before we learned that the planning board did, um, well, not the planning board, their letter was submitted, but that the you know, for-profit decided to pull out. But we did decide, we had a conversation, Council of Flynn and I saying like, we still wanna go forward with this. And one of the reasons why we did invite the planning department is because you know, we wanted to ask the questions of, you know, this was this time, what will happen later? So I really do hope they're listening in because a lot of what you have talked about, you know, about the invest now, pay later, mm -hmm. you know, I just hope they're listening in and understand that, you know, we are one city and our departments have to work together and all the work you do, Dr. Ochakutu, thank you, but we have to make sure that, you know, when we do have departments who were asked to come to these hearings. And it's questions that we want to ask to get an understanding of how going forward can we support the, I mean, it's not just amazing work, it's life-saving work, right? Mm -hmm. People are dying when they don't have access to health care. But because we do have the opportunity to have you here, I think our hearing kind of shifted to more of a needed conversation too about the things you do and how heading into the budget season we can support all of the health centers and the Public Health Commission um, Councilor Flynn and I actually went for a tour, was it yesterday maybe, with Tufts and um, the things they were talking about, the nursing staff, you know, retention and trying to keep the staff, something you mentioned. So all of the concerns I know our hospitals have, you must have also at the health center. So trying to figure out how do we balance that. Um, and I know the great services, you know, that South Boston, East Boston Health Center offer. Um, but also when we're going through this process with, you know, steward healthcare and, you know, these learning about, like, I think when we had that here and talking about, you know, the Kearney office mental health beds mm -hmm. and, you know, St. Elizabeth's has a big OBGYN mm -hmm. service. So there's going to be pockets, right, of lost services, but always it doesn't like, the, the need never goes away, right? So mm -hmm. that's what keeps you all up at night, right? Knowing mm -hmm. that the need's always there, even if a health center has to close or a hospital is closing, the, the need's always there. But if you could just talk through the kinds of health, because um, I'm not really sure, but knowing like, and I may be wrong, but if you check in and you need a bed for mental health, like it costs the hospital or the health center more, right? And you mentioned how these for-profit kind of skim, right? For the easier patients, that get more reimbursement, but is there some kind of checklist, a few types of things that you know, these for-profit or just hospitals realize it's a financial burden, knowing that you always take your patients no matter what, but is there some that are more costly to the system than others, some needs? Mm -hmm. Services? 
Yeah, like is it mental health, like certain ones that when you try to get, you know, the reimbursement if they have insurance that. From, from my perspective, um, behavioral health is exceedingly, um, exceedingly uh, under reimbursed. But, you know, it, it brings up a broader, um, a broader issue. Because uh, really, if you look at, you know, I tell my finance committee every single meeting, we lose money on every single patient that comes through the door. If, if you take out my HRSA grant and other federal and state and city grants. So from a reimbursement perspective, literally every patient that comes in the door, I'm losing money on. Like, and, and it's a combination of things. It's the reimbursements flow and I, we provide a whole bunch of services that for-profits do not provide. I, I'd be shocked if a for-profit urgent care has an interpreter service. Right. I'd be shocked if they have a, um, a, a, a financial counselor mm -hmm. available. Mm -hmm. If you come into my health center, and, and again, I, I'm sure you all are aware of this, but if you come into my health center and you don't, you need to be seen, and you don't have health insurance, we, we shift you off to our financial counselors um, who help get you signed up for, for um, Mass Health. I mean, we see you first, and then we do all, all of this, but I have to pay the financial counselors. Mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're wonderful people, but I don't think they'd work for free. I worry behavior. too, yeah, the behavioral health or mental health services, and it's usually related to those in society where there's still stigma associated, mm -hmm. and it seems like those yeah. are the ones we need to provide yeah. more. But then, even a lot of health centers, I know, don't, a lot of patients will say, or just residents are like, oh, I didn't even know those services were provided there, right? Mm -hmm. They're not mm -hmm. really um, advertised much, but. Mm -hmm. And, and just to, so I think the answer is all of the above, right, is that the services are expensive, right, and the technology is expensive to have the right medical record to, to engage and, and make sure you're providing the care. Uh, mental health is under reimbursed. Commercial is under reimbursed at health centers, and we have a bill before the legislature on that. The fact that if you have commercial insurance and you walk into a health center, because we don't have the market power to negotiate, we don't negotiate as a, as a, a system or a network, um, we don't necessarily get reimbursed an appropriate um, uh, level for that care. Um, Medicaid, we just got the state just a few years ago to reposition all of our rates across uh, the health system system. So we're still running at a deficit, but I wanna just say from a business model standpoint, and this is a values question, from a business model standpoint, after everything we said, you wouldn't run that business. <laughs> right? It's losing money. Mm -hmm. But we understand that we pay greater later because those same communities in South Boston, mm -hmm. they get sicker, they show up in our system elsewhere. So we need to make sure when you walk in, and this is the beauty of health centers too, you may come in for one reason and we identify something else you need care for. Mm -hmm. right? We ask you, you know, you feel safe at home. Mm -hmm. Right? Are you um, dealing with substance use disorder? So now you go down the hall in the same facility to now go get signed up for substance use disorder services. That doesn't exist in a pharmacy that is for-profit. That doesn't exist in a lot of these other for-profit entities. And the reason why is because the mission isn't the same. And our mission is across uh, South Boston and the rest of the health centers is really to meet the, your needs when you walk in whatever they may be, and whatever insurance you have, uh, no matter what your circumstances, your zip code, your race, your gender, your sexual orientation, we're gonna meet that need. Thank you, and thank you, Chair. I know we'll spend a lot of time as on these issues. No, thank absolutely. You. Thank you, Council Murphy. Council Durkin. 
floor is yours. Thank you so much, Chair Fitzgerald. I'm trying to get near perfect attendance, um, so and I wanted to he be here to support um, in your committee, and I would wanted to be here to support my um, South Boston and Dorchester colleagues who have been fighting hard for uh, for this, and also had just recently toured Fenway Health um, and seen some of the great work they do uh, to support the LGBTQIA community and. Um, and I'm just interested in, um, in sort of what the bottom lines are for Community Health Center. So thank you so much for uh, Dr. Brazola Ujikutu and all you do for the city, um, but also Michael and Bill, uh, thank you for lending your expertise to this hearing. Um, also, I represent a lot of the hospitals um, in, in Boston and um, have been having very detailed conversations about the lack of beds and everything that's going on um, and just the lack of being able, lack of care and lack of um, finding the right expertise to to really um, and, and sort of, I experienced it myself, went to the hospital um, for a really bad sprained ankle and had to wait five hours uh, to see uh, for my x-ray to come back. So I was x-rayed within an hour but then had to wait another three hours for someone to, who could look at the x-ray. Um, so I've experienced it myself, and I know um, you know there are challenges with um, insurance and with reimbursements, and had a great walkthrough of a lot of that at Fenway Health. Um, but I uh, just wanted to be here to support, and I really appreciate um, you know I, the letters that you both provided um, to to talk a little more about what South Boston and Dorchester are dealing with at this time. Um, and I can't really speak to that. I know my colleagues have, have spoken to that at length. Uh, but just wanted to thank you all for being here. I'm mostly here to listen and look forward to, um, I was in something earlier, but look forward to hearing uh, the earlier part of your testimony earlier. Um, is there anything we should expect sort of on the, and I guess I'll direct this to Michael Curry. Thank you for being here. Uh, is there anything we should expect um, in Boston in general for community health centers of like forecasting and financial modeling um, and, and how can we advocate? You mentioned something at the State House. Yep. Um, I've testified now, right now at three, since in my last first seven months, three times at the State House. What can we as the, as the City Council advocate for at the State House? That would be helpful to you. So, so one, and I, and I mentioned in my testimony the model of Mayor Menino when he fought the, the minute clinics and the proliferation of those in the city, right, is the, the, the ability to see where we are now and what the implications of something, and I think this council is doing that. Um, there will be many other for-profit entities that want to come into Massachusetts. As a state, we've been fighting off for-profit entities. Mm -hmm. Most of our health plans are for, uh, not for profit. Most of our hospital systems, if not all of our, most of our, not most of our hospital systems, with the exception of Stewart hospitals, and I think maybe others, are, are not for profit. And we chose that as a commonwealth, that we want a non-profit, majority non-profit system. I say that to say I, we should expect this to be a conversation that is well beyond this hearing today, and we have to make a decision on what kind of a city or what kind of state we want. Um, in terms of what's coming, the reality is, is health centers are struggling, and they're struggling for all the reasons that Bill lifted up today. Um, when um, Councilor Murphy mentioned earlier the, the challenges that we see in the hospital systems, imagine if you're a hospital and you're struggling to find a nurse or a doctor and you can pay them much more in a sign-on bonus and much more in salary than Bill can pay them. Um, people are making choices to go where they get paid more and we have to, and this, this may sound you know, unbelievable to some, we gotta keep them with the mission that people are genuinely saying, I'm gonna stay because I like the culture, I like the workplace at, at South Boston Health Center, mm -hmm. and I like that we're serving communities I come out of, so I'm gonna stay here, despite the fact I could leave and make 15, 20, 30, 40,000 dollars somewhere else. That's a challenge, um, and that means investment. Um, if you rely on sort of capitalism, sort of the market to sort of bear itself out, and we should just compete with those bigger systems, that will never happen. Um, we're not financed in the same way. So it really requires you know, local government, state government, national, federal government to say, no, we need Bill to be in place. If we want to do the public health work with Dr. Jakutu that she's doing on the ground, and we need institutions in those communities mm -hmm. that will keep people healthy, we've got to invest in them. Mm -hmm. And if we don't, we will lose them. And Fenway, to your point about Fenway, you know, we've been struggling to keep Fenway. Fenway is, is really challenged right now financially. 
And uh, thanks to you and, and so many others advocating for Fenway, I'm hopeful and confident we'll keep it. But um, there'll be others that are facing financial challenges for the same reasons, workforce, uh, under reimbursement. And what you can't do directly, you can do indirectly by advocating with your colleagues on the Hill, um, with the governor uh, around investment. Thank you, and I know um, I'll do everything I can with my state house colleagues to advocate for Fenway and other health centers who really need um, an acknowledgement at the state level of what they are bringing to the table and what they're providing for our communities because we can't continue to have hospital beds that are unavailable for folks that could have been treated much earlier with preventative care. Um, and I'll just, uh, I just wanted to add to your question a bit. Um, so it sounds like what we can do as consumers is utilize community health centers when we have the option to make sure that our health care resources and our insurance money are going to support. Um, so that's something I hadn't really thought about as a consumer. While it might be easy to go, um, especially I live in Beacon Hill and live closer to downtown, it may be easier to book an appointment um, at a for-profit health center, but choosing to even go out of the way to support community health centers might be one solution for how we can make sure that our hospital, you know, our, our um, resources and our insurance funds are going, um, going farther. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Durkin. Councilor Rowell, I know you have one more quick question. Quick question. Yep, go ahead. Um, and it was something I read a, a while ago, and I just looked it up on my phone rather quickly, is um, Dr. Ojikuti was talking about, like, investing upstream. Um, and one thing that came to my mind was uh, California, they just passed um, a law um, around banning uh, food additives. Um, that were linked to diseases such as cancer. Mm -hmm. um, are, are there any other policies that you think, you know, I know education is one way, but how do we also make sure that we're investing upstream mm -hmm. in education or through policy to kind of um, encourage good good habits, mm -hmm. you know, to, to our constituents in the, in the Boston? Well, I think that's a great question, and certainly I'm sure Michael <laughs> and, um, mm -hmm. and Bill would also have things to say about that. One of the things that I would say is in terms of investment, I think we need to invest in the t entire health ecosystem, which means investing yeah. downstream at community health centers and yeah. investing upstream yeah. and investing in the in-between. <laughs> you know, I just want to make sure. Yeah. I just want to make sure that we're clear everywhere. about that. Yeah. Um, secondly, in terms of policies, I mean, like I said, Michael can talk about an act to advance health equity, which I think is incredibly important, large omnibus bills currently in committee. Mm. Part of that is about public health, and mm -hmm. I'll just am amplify that. It's about this concept of health equity zones. Okay, mm -hmm. so what that means is you're essentially investing at the state level in communities where we know that there are challenges. The mm -hmm. census tracts that we know where there's lower life expectancy, mm -hmm. where we know there are higher rates of cardiometabolic disease, where you have 30% hypertension, like I just mentioned in South Boston investing there so the community, like they do at community health centers, can decide what to do. They can say, okay, we need to think about how do we decrease drug use? How do we decrease the fact that there's, you know, uh, liquor stores around? You know, how do we increase walkability in this neighborhood? How do we make, optimize our community based on our lived experiences there? So that is a policy that I think is very, very important, but I'd love for Michael to speak um, more comprehensively about an act to advance health equity. Yeah, um, <laughs> we miss Black History Month, but it's Women's History Month, so I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna start to comment to that with a quote by a phenomenal black woman, um, Rebecca Lee Crumpler, the first African-American physician in 1864. So with all the women that are phenomenal in this room, imagine being in 1864 and becoming a physician in Boston. Boston yeah. Um, with the uh, oppression of women, and of course we were still dealing with the remnants of slavery at that time. And she said, they seem to forget there's a cause for every ailment and it may be in their power to remove it. Right. There's a reason why people are sick. <laughs> there's a reason why people die at higher rates. So the reality is, to Dr. Ojikuto's point, there's policy that can respond to that. The empowerment zone is an example of that. How do you do the wraparound services to go after disease by neighborhood? And if you think about Harlem Children's Zone, many years ago, Jeffrey Callender, I was always used that example, they wanted to go after kids' achievement, underachievement, and they said, okay, we're gonna get them uh, uh, tutoring services. We're gonna get, make sure they have a meal when they go home. We gave them a safe environment. So you do those 360 
wraparound of what a child needs to thrive. Now we can talk about the healthcare. How do you do the 360 wraparound on what a community needs to live healthy and healthier? Uh, and that's what Dr. Ojikutu and others have been kind of thinking about how we do that in Boston. And there's an effort underway to, to explore that. Um, but so many other aspects of that bill, equity at the table. And when you're talking about these issues, Jim Hunt, a good friend of Bill's, had my favorite quote, one of my favorite quotes. He said, if you're not at the table, you're on the table or you're on the menu. <laughs> um, and that means how do you have a secretary of equity at the state level? How do you position in the city departments people like Dr. Jakutu who come into those jobs with a passion for equity, with a, an unweathering, I call it, meaning that they're not going to be comfortable with the fact that South Boston could live seven years less than the state average. They're going to be upset and, and, and have an urgency to address that. We need to have positions in government where people come in and have authority and influence to change those things. And then data, um, that which gets measured, measured, counted, gets done. We don't have the data, so we don't know where disease is the way we should. We don't, like we did the COVID. We don't have the data and then we don't have the dashboard that reminds us on a daily level what sickness looks like in, Ma in Boston. So then, then we can respond. Now, the, the, the city report that Dr. Ojikutu brought out is phenomenal, but we want to make that statewide around how do we collect data, how do we evaluate it, and then how we act on it across the Commonwealth. And then most importantly, we underfund, and I use the term intentionally, we defunded public health infrastructure in this country. And I say defund, because we defund things all the time. We defunded public health, which is why we didn't respond well to COVID because uh, folks like Dr. Ojikutu didn't have the resources they needed to contact trace, to test, to vaccinate, to dispel myths about uh, vaccinations, to convince communities who, who don't trust healthcare for a reason <laughs> that they could trust in this particular circumstance and we needed you to come in. Um, we gotta figure out a better way to do that. I feel confident, I say this all the time, as much as I complain about Boston and Massachusetts, we are the best of the worst. <laughs> we tend to do better than everybody else around the country, but we can do better. Right. And one more time, what was the name of the, the bill? It, the, the Act to Advance Health Equity. And I think the city could make a statement if the city came out in support of that bill saying that, no, we also want to um, advance health equity in the Commonwealth, and we believe in it as well. I think that would be a huge statement. It is the only bill of its kind in the country. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. mm -hmm. yeah, right. 85 leaders of color, who run health systems and business and public health came together, crafted a bill, mm -hmm. and presented that omnibus bill on the Hill. There's nothing like it in the country, mm -hmm. and there's an opportunity to act on it. Thank you for that. No further questions. Uh, thank you, Council Rowell. Uh, before we go to public testimony, I'd just like to ask if any of my colleagues have any final things to, to, to questions to ask. Council Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll be very brief. I just have one. Well, well, before I ask the question, I want to say thank you to Michael. I want to say thank you to Bill and, and to Dr. Ojakutu for being here, but more importantly for your dedication and leadership in helping so many families in need access medical care. We, we appreciate what you're doing. Um, my question is to Dr. Ojakutu. Um, I know you mentioned the report that will soon be released on the status of public health in our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. One thing I was always concerned with, Dr. Ojakutu, and I know we've, we've worked on this issue many times, mm -hmm. but um, the, the report itself doesn't get into the details about health issues of the Chinese community in the downtown Chinatown area. Mm -hmm. They get, they, it's more inclusive, and it's including the areas in and around Chinatown with more of the wealthier white mm -hmm. communities, neighbors. Mm -hmm. I, I always want to look at the data on Chinese families, immigrant families, mm -hmm. and my request would be, and I know it's tough to get the actual data because it's such a small segment or a smaller segment of the population. But I would, I, I would like to get the data of just the Asian community in the 
downtown area mm -hmm. specifically so I can have a better understanding of mm -hmm. exactly what the issues are impacting the Chinese community. Certainly I know, I, I know a lot, I studied this often about the public health of the Asian community, but could you mm -hmm. um, see if we were able to get that data just for the, uh, specifically for the Chinese community in the downtown area? Absolutely. We've been working on small area estimates okay. and getting more granular with our data. As you probably noticed, we're getting census track level data where we have like a, a, a dashboard where we can look in more depth. So why don't we work on this and after the hearing I'll talk to my team and see what we can get you. I think the other piece that you're highlighting is really important, this question of nativity. You know, where are people actually from as opposed to lumping them as Asian? <laughs> you know? I mean, that, what does that really say about people? I think we need to understand more about them. We have been having some discussions about how to get better data about who Boston residents are and what their specific challenges are. Thank you, Dr. Ojakuto, and um, appreciate your response and looking forward to um, working with you and your team. Mm -hmm. Again, want to say thank you to all three uh, members of the panel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council. Council Murphy. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for all of this and also for uplifting Mr. Hunt. I know his wife, Jean, <laughs> also, and Mr. Doyle have been, you know, champions in the healthcare world and making sure, you know, that we keep our health, open them and then keep them open, right? Once we open them, people come and then we have to make sure we continue to provide for them. I did just want to uplift, you know, that once in a lifetime opportunity during OPER and Council of mm -hmm. Flynn, you know, advocated and got some good money for the food pantry at the South Boston mm -hmm. Health Center. Mm -hmm. I know Congressman Lynch always does what he can, but thank you just for reminding us about not just underfunding, but defunding. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's making sure that those who can, right? I know mm -hmm. Nick Collins and others, you know, they try hard, but when there is an opportunity, because there isn't always times mm -hmm. that we should make sure we're not missing those opportunities. So mm -hmm. anytime you can remind us what we can do to uplift here on the city, but also if something's happening at the state or the federal level mm -hmm. where we could help advocate, please give us work, because it's work we need to do. So thank you, and thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, before we go to public testimony, I know some folks uh, have some hard stops and need to leave. I would encourage those that can stay to listen to public testimony to do so if they are able, uh, but understanding that we've, we, you know, we got the heads up that some of you have to go and that, that is fine. So now would be the time. I thank you all. No, please, it's uh, understandable. I thank you all for coming, panel, as well. I know I have a, uh, a tour of uh, Neponset Health Center in April, <laughs> and so this education uh, was very good for me uh, and, and will inform some of my questions uh, there, so thank you for that. Thank um, you, Mr. Um, Mr. Chair, I would say this, if there is the time that you want to do tours of health centers as a city council um, to Bill's earlier recommendation, we'd be, you know, more than welcome to organize something where you do a, a sitting tour to visit a few. If you've seen one health center, you've seen one health center. That's right. That's We'd love to have true. it. That's very no, I, I appreciate that, Mr. Curry. Uh, thank you, panel, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, we'll now move forward with public testimony. When your name is called, please come down to one of the two podiums, state your name, neighborhood, and or organization affiliation, uh, and please speak into the microphone. We also do have one person on Zoom, um, and so we'll start with the person on Zoom, and then Mr. Bro uh, John, we'll get to you uh, in one second. Uh, but uh, Michelle Nadal, the president and CEO of Dot House Health, uh, if we have her on the Zoom, um, President Nato, now is your, your, your time to testify. You have about two minutes, but we'll, we'll take what you need. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're looking forward to welcoming you at our health center later in March. And uh, so very excited about that opportunity and has been great to work with your staff. I just want to thank, uh, in addition to the chair, the vice chair, members of the committee, the council, as well as the folks who preceded me, Dr. Ojukutu, and my good colleagues and friends, um, Dr. Or, uh, Mr. Curry and Mr. Halpin. I'm going to try not to duplicate what they said because I don't think I could improve upon their phenomenal contributions. Um, I think what I would like to start with is that Dot House Health, which is where I am the president and CEO, um, and have been here for 19 years, eight as a CEO, has always been here when our community needs us, much like every other health center in the city, right? We started in 1887 as a settlement house, 
and then became a health center in 1972 when people in the neighborhood formed an organization called the Determined People of Dorchester and went to Washington, D.C. to advocate for funding to create a health center in Fields Corner. And, and since then, we've evolved to meet the community needs, including over 15 years ago, setting up an urgent care, set, uh, urgent care clinic in our health center. Now, we serve about 22,000 uh, individuals a year. Our patient population is incredibly diverse. About a third of our patients self-identify as Asian. That's predominantly Vietnamese. Another third African-American or Black about 20% Latinx and about 7% white. 85% of our patients live at or below 200% of poverty and 47% prefer to have their services delivered in a language other than English. 60% of our patients are insured via public products like Medicaid or Medicare and 10% are uninsured. And so when the community expressed this need, for kind of quick care, for low acuity, you know, the sore, sore throat, GI issues, we formed an urgent care that was available not only to our patients, but to the community, um, to community members at, as well. And, and just to be um, clear, there are very um, distinct differences between an FQHC, a federally qualified health center offering urgent care services versus a for-profit urgent care center. And, and one is that Dot House uh, provides services to all patients and all people, regardless of ability to pay and regardless of insurance type. And as we've heard earlier, um, many urgent care centers kind of cherry pick the insurance that they're going to accept and often refuse Medicaid and the patient population they're gonna serve and the conditions they treat. Typically, these for-profit urgent cares don't have good language access for people who prefer to have their services delivered than in language other than English. At Dot House, throughout the health center and including ur urgent care, we have incredible language access through in-person interpretation, a telephonic language language line, and all of our materials, you know, our, our patient follow-up information, our signage, our wayfinding, are all in the dominant languages of the service area. Um, we really provide a medical home pathway in our urgent care. For, for years, we've been able to usher people into a medical home who come into urgent care who don't have a regular primary care provider or a regular source of care. Or if they, they you know, Dot House isn't convenient to them, we can refer them to somewhere else to start that primary care relationship. In addition, if a, a patient comes to us who has a primary care provider that's not associated with Dot House, we make sure that we get the results of that visit to um, their primary care provider. So a continuity of care can continue in order to support the good health and the good health, health outcomes for that patient. I know that for-profit urgent care centers do not provide that nav navigation to, to access a medical home or provide the, the needed continuity of care pieces so that, um, so that if we do go in this direction, um, of, of supporting for-profit urgent care centers, you know, what we would foresee is a weakening of primary care relationships and a really fragmented care system that is already at a really fragile state right now. Um, so, you know, in closing, I think we're all in agreement here. I know we have strong support from the city council that we, we appreciate and have worked so well together in support of our, our patients and our neighbors and our community. But really, I think, you know, these for-profit health centers, health, or urgent care centers are just about margins, right? Um, you know, as far as I can tell. And we need more than that strategy alone to really impact the health disparities that our communities are facing. You know, Dot House, um, as long as well as my other health center colleagues in the city, we're the living embodiment of mission and margin. As Bill said, we we figure out to do what's right, we do it, and we'll figure out how to get paid on the back end. But but at that moment, our goal is to meet those evolving community needs, like we did during the pandemic by setting up testing and vaccination and telehealth, um, as well as a variety of other services. You know, we have a very robust food pantry here. Teen Center, Tax Clinic, right? Those are the, the impacts that are really gonna hopefully change the uh, health outcome uh, trajectories. 
Um, finally, health centers are an anchor in our communities, right? We're an anchor for good health, but also for workforce. Dot House employs 280 people, 60% of whom live in our service area. So for those reasons, I think, um, you know, this is so important to be able to speak to the potential impact of urgent care, for-profit urgent care centers on health centers and, the, and in Boston. And I really appreciate the council uplifting this topic and am so grateful for their advocacy and attention and support on this and really would uh, like to continue working on this together. That concludes my testimony. I did send written remarks to the committee in advance. Thank you so much, President Nato, and I look forward to my visit uh, upcoming uh, to Dot House as well. So look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, one fellow person with testimony, uh, Mr. Provenzano, you are up, sir, if you would so like to testify. Thank you. Great. I wish I could speak as well as this own young lady who just finished, but uh, I can't, I've been in South Boston my whole life, and um, especially after we retired, my wife and I, uh, the services that we get from the health center, South Boston Health Center, and now my young family, my granddaughter who has a couple of children, goes to the Dorchester house because she was unemployed after the can pandemic and all, and it was just, uh, it's, it's a lifesaver. I, you could tell by my age, I go back to house calls, doctor's house calls. This is the closest thing to doctors having a doctor house call. They're so personal to us. And, and it, I wanted to mention one other thing that there are people fortunate like myself and my wife that we have our uh, Medicare and we have the secondary health, health insurance is that we also, whatever balances there are, we're there to pay them. And they allow us to do that in increments if it's a, if it's a big cost, whether it's the dental or, or just, you know, a illness. Um, on the negative side, I would just like to say we had experience one time with the for-profit uh, services. We were out of state for a couple of days and my wife unfortunately got sick and I didn't know the area, we were in Pennsylvania. And the first thing that I saw when I went down the road, I didn't have the GPS to get me to the main hospital and it was a really bad experience. There was no connection whatsoever with the patient to the point where when we walked out of there, I went to the nearest, uh, found out where the nearest police station was to t let me know where the hospital was. The one thing about our clinics, and thank you for letting me just speak this few minutes with this. I really appreciate the four of you for being here and, and bringing this to light. And I wish the, I wish the stands were full with people who could let you know how, how uh, helpful these centers are is um, that <sighs> I took my notes right here and it's, 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 it's so bad that I'm sorry. Um, the people, if you went to the health center, and you had a particular problem, whatever it might be that you needed more emergency care, and I experienced this myself, within 10 minutes, I was at the Boston City Hospital. That's the beauty of the centers, that they're connected with the Boston City Hospital. And I was over there in 10 minutes, and it was to do with the heart. I mean, you can't get any worse than that. Now, to just to go to a profit, place, do you think you're going to get that kind of, I wish there was some, because I don't like talking about people unless they're in front of me, to let them know what their real goal is, and that's that bottom line of having a couple of people in a, in a clinic that can't do very much but take your blood pressure and a couple of other things, and that's it, and that's, that, that's the scary part. I'll, I'll end it, I, I could go, I make notes here, but I get fouled up with it, so I'm going to let that go. I want to thank the four of you 
and Megan uh, for letting me speak, uh, allow me to speak. And uh, if there's anything going on in the future where we have to get together as a group and whether it's protesting or just bringing the media in to let them know how important the centers are to a lot of families. I'd, I'd be welcome to be part of that. And if you have any questions, I'll answer them if I can. But no. I know that doesn't come. Mr. Provenzano, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you for sharing your experiences. Yeah, thank uh, you very much matter. for letting me do that. Really thank appreciate you. it. Yep. Um, uh, with that, we will look to close. Uh, I'd like to thank all the, uh, uh, the members of the panel that came, all the folks who testified, the folks tuning in online. Um, much thanks to Council Worrell, Council Durkin, Council President Louis Jen, and a special thanks to uh, Council Flynn and Council Murphy for bringing this attention to matter. It's very important. It's something that affects all our community. Um, and so uh, with that, if there are no closing remarks, uh, I would like to uh, say that the hearing on docket 0264 is now adjourned. Thank you.